today. It's the front of the Financial Times showing riot police guarding the parliament in Athens after huge protests against those austerity measures. The FT says the Eurozone is looking to pare back the 170 billion euro cost of Greece's rescue package. Moving on to more protests in Spain. You've been hearing about it here as well, of course. This is El País covering the protests in the capital, Madrid, on Sunday. It says the newly elected conservative government of Mariano Rojoy had its first taste of civil unrest. The International Herald Tribune analyzes the effect of Iran's decision to cut off oil exports to Britain and France. The paper says Iran's gambit may be aimed at dividing the EU over its sanctions against Tehran. Small companies in Britain should have more freedom to fire workers, the Times says. That's the sharp advice being given to Chancellor George Osborne by a group of Conservative MPs who argue making it easier to show workers the door will enhance Britain's competitiveness. The South China Morning Post says 2011 was a very good year to buy high-end wine in Asia after a huge price slump, especially the Chateau Lafitte, the famous French tipple. But the paper warns prices for the good stuff are set to rise again. And nothing like a dame for some fashion tips. The Independent says designer dame Vivian Westwood is thinking that we are all, we've never dressed so badly apparently as they do now because disposable fashion means everything is so similar. We just throw it away. Mm. This, the chic has gone. It would be nice to show up at work dressed exactly as she is right now. <laughs> Sally and I are joined by Bundeep Rangard, the chairman of Indus View. I'm, I'm just kidding and everyone knows that. Bundeep, welcome to the program. Greece again on the front burner. I don't know how long this is going to continue. It seems like for a while. Um, meeting in Brussels, according to the paper, 170 billion is needed. 136 billion in fresh funding. 34 billion left over from the last time, and six billion more than they expected from uh, you know the, the last bailout. You you begin to wonder when and how is this issue going to be resolved, and whether this really is the way to deal with this, because a number of pundits are arguing that uh, perhaps this bailout thing is, is just not working. Well, I guess what at stake here is the first potential default by a sovereign since the euro was created on the euro currency. And, and we're running really tight on time, right? So today's when they come to hopefully an agreement. They've got two more days then to table something to the private debt holders, who then have 10 days to come to, to accept the offers. And that's one week before that March 20th deadline for a 14.5 billion repayment. Now, chances that it'll go through, but missing in all this or sort of hidden underneath all this is not just the uh, agreement on the bailout packet. It's all the measures that have to be put in place by Greece to meet the various uh, austerity demands by the IMF and the ECB. Uh, amongst them, of course, cutbacks in defense spending, cutbacks in the public sector. And that lends to the question you asked, is that the right way? Because that's not going to necessarily spur growth at a time when Greece's debt to GDP ratio is hitting about 160 percent. And I wonder if a lot of people in Greece are not saying, should we go back to the draft where we can lower our currency 30 percent boost exports, because ultimately we're not going to benefit from a lower cost here with the, with the way things are going. Well, it's quite funny you should say that because on, on the front of the companies and markets edition of today's Financial Times, it, it talks about here that banks are saying that their clients now are asking them to provide products that basically uh, hedge them against uh, the fact that a country will then return to its own currency. So if they're exposed to that, they need products that will hedge them against that risk. And that's the tricky one here, right? Because there's. I mean, how do banks come up with those kind of products? I wonder. <laughs> I've got to be honest. Nice synthetic products. The fear, of course, is if one leaves, other people leave, of course. And if Greece is allowed to fall, it has a contagion effect that, of course, the northern European countries who are defending the euro don't want to see it happen. But it is a really tricky one because it's not spurring growth. It's really just cutting more into the meat at this point. Let's look at El Pais. First, you get the power, then you get the demonstrations. Uh, Mariano Rajoy. Uh, recently elected and now being confronted by the unions and they're quite upset because of uh, the new policies that's supposed to liberalize the job market when by uh, enabling companies to, to fire workers much 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 easier and well part of the thousands on the streets and it's 57 different demonstrations yeah, across, across Spain I mean we're looking at Madrid and, and we see Barcelona of course but it was right across the country it's one of the biggest protests in Spain since these austerity measures measures kicked in and it's part of the next 40 billion euros that the government has to put in place in part to, to meet the, the requirements of their last kind of bailout that they had. Um, and underneath that, of course, what Spain trying to do is trying to make this economy more competitive. And, and labor reform is a key part of that. Remember, Spain
Spain has one of the highest, if not the highest, unemployment rate at 23% in the developed world, compared to about 7 8% it was just five years ago. So and it's, it's predicted to get swipe. higher and higher as well. There's nothing really to get that lower at the moment. Unless you create new jobs. And part of the job creation is getting the employers in the country to feel more confident, and therefore the labor reforms are part of that. The question is, at what time does it have a heavy political cost versus the slowly resurrection of the Spanish economy and then the hiring to start back in. And that's a critical question because it's not really uh, something that you can predict very easily. And, and, um, and you'll see the effects of that in other European countries too. It's not just Spain. And there must be a real fear factor for the Spanish people, those people who you know, are in the streets protesting. Because, of course, they know what's going on in Greece. They know what's going on in Portugal where the two economies are having to digest even harsher austerity measures and cuts in minimum wage and what have you than those in Spain. So Spain's kind of next if it doesn't get its, uh, at least Spain doesn't have a crazy debt to GDP ratio. It's got somewhat more healthier there. But in terms of creating employment, it needs to get more spurs for growth. And that will require getting more younger people and back to jobs because that's where the unemployment is the highest, reducing some things like, you know, the wages that they get for uh, for holiday allowance, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where some of the pain starts kicking into the electorate. Well, Sally, you used the words fear factor. Those mm -hmm. are exactly the same words that are being used by uh, the British <coughs> Member of Parliament, Elizabeth Truss. Said, she says she wants to remove the fear factor for small businesses by making it easier for businesses to fire people. If your <laughs> business has less than 10 people, they should remove this impediment because it will make British businesses more competitive. Probably will not go down very well with uh, a lot of workers at, at this time. Well, if you look at the, the small business as they, as they define, they're less than 10 employees. They're responsible for 1.6 million jobs in this country compared to the largest private employer, which is Tesco's, which has just over a quarter million employees. So it's a huge powerhouse for, for employment. But again, part of it is the cost of small business today. Because you look at the increase in VAT that came in, you look at the general cost that companies have to bear as part of greater red tape and greater um, just cost of doing business, and then you've got a less flexible labor market. It just compounds the whole thing. Maybe they should make changes to tax or, or national insurance. How inflexible is it? Oh, labor market for small businesses the in way, the UK. I way I describe it, it's not as flexible as the US, but it's more flexible than the continent of Europe. And, and the big challenge, of course, is that Asia is far more flexible in many ways. And that's where some of the competition is coming for, for a lot of British jobs. Because you wonder as well that if, you know, you make it so flexible, i.e. so easy for those who run very small businesses to, to hire and fire, what's going to be the attraction for somebody who's going to be taken on as a member of staff? It's going to that's be, true. And it's, I think, it's a difficult one, isn't it? I think there's a lesson to be borrowed from what Obama's done in the States, where there are incentives to hire and there's reductions in the cost for the, for the employer to hire people, such as a payroll tax uh, cut, et cetera, et cetera, or in the UK with national insurance, you can play with that, not necessarily to make it make an employee feel vulnerable at all times, and that's, that's not the right message. Let's take a quick look at the International Herald Tribune uh, reporting on Iran cutting <coughs> off oil deliveries to Britain and France. Uh, one uh, British official saying, well, you know, they provide just like 1% of, of Britain's oil. Is this a sign of Tehran's increasing desperation, you think? I think it's a great publicity stunt, because at the end of the day, what they've done is they've said no to Britain and France, who are the smallest importers of Iranian oil. If they really wanted to make an impact, they should have said Italy, or Spain, who collectively make part of that 18 percent uh, export market for Iranian oil in, in, in Europe. So it is kind of like, yes, a bit of let's kind of divide and rule the opposite way, but it's also a great publicity stunt. It's quite an interesting time as well, isn't it, to be playing this game, because with Spain and Italy and Greece and others at such a critical point, and yet they do have good deals with Tehran on their oil, you know, quite cheap deals. And they're not going to get the same sort of deals elsewhere, and yet they've got this very difficult <laughs> economic budget they're trying to balance. It is clever because Greece today imports about 60% of its oil from, from Iran, so it is a huge importer. And it's not going to affect things like China, which will continue to be the biggest importer of Iranian oil. So it is a very clever tactic on their part at a time when there's this kind of um, saber rattling going on with the Straits of Hormuz, and of course, lots of pressure in Iran to cut back on the nuclear program. So it's part of a wider picture and, and, and well played by Iran. Do you want to take it? Well, I don't or mind. I? Wine or clothes? What do you want to talk about? Let's talk about clothes. <laughs> um, Go on, then. You get a lot of compliments about your ties and your suits. Um, Vivian Westwood says we all dress like uh, clones. What do you think? Hey, would you like to show? Let's see. Oh, yeah, that's the picture I was looking for. <laughs> Thank um, you. That looks more newsy. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, you know, she, I think she's great. And, and, of course, I get compliments from me, which is great. I think the whole challenge here is, of course, that people are so pressed for time that they don't exactly take the effort that they could take maybe, you know, 30 years ago. 
And then no wonder she says people in their 70s are the most well-dressed. Mm. Um, I think Europe does a great job in dressing well, and I think we carry on the tradition here. All right. Well, it's London Fashion Week, of course, which is it why is. she's in the papers. It but is. anyway. Thanks very much, Bundi. You're welcome. Thank you for coming. And Bundi Branga from Indusville. And that's all we have for now on our newspaper review. More news coming up shortly. Bye-bye.